There are many things which I might have derived good, by which I have not profited, I dare say, Christmas among the rest. But I am sure I have always thought of Christmas time when it has come round, apart from the veneration due its sacred name and origin. If anything belonging to it can be apart from that, as a good time, a kind, forgiving, charitable, pleasant time, the only time I know of in the long calendar of the year, when men and women seem by one consent to open their shut-up hearts freely, and to think of people below them as if they really were fellow passengers to the grave, and not another race of creatures bound on other journeys. And therefore, Uncle, though it has never put a scrap of gold or silver in my pocket, I believe that it has done me good and will do me good. And I say, God bless it. Hello and welcome back to A Cozy Christmas Podcast. My name is Art and welcome back, everybody. It is getting ever so closer to Christmas now. Time is flying by. My episode today, I hope you're able to sit back and relax and enjoy this wonderful conversation I have with two guests. One is coming back from last year. I have with me today, Mark Shanahan, who is the writer and director of, of A Sherlock Carol. It's now being performed uh, off Broadway in New York City. There's also one uh, a showing in London, I believe. And hopefully by next year, it will be going out into and throughout the United States because I want to see this play. I also am, have the privilege of talking with the actor Drew McFetty, who is playing uh, Sherlock Holmes. I really enjoyed this conversation with them. If any of you live in or near New York City, you need to check out this show. I will have a link in the show notes where you can buy tickets. Any of you out there, to, if you're able to go and see it, report back. And because uh, I, I really want to know what it's like and how, how it goes. So what it is basically is a, a mashup of Sherlock Holmes meets Ebenezer Scrooge and shenanigans ensue. And I, I think it sounds like such a, a well done production. Based on what I, I, I'm getting from, from Mark and from Drew, just a wonder, wonderful people and a wonderful show. Coming up on Tuesday, December 20th, will be our 100th episode celebration. If you can, send in your questions for our question and answer episode. I'll be recording this weekend, so I need those questions in now. Pause the episode, send me in a question for our 100th episode coming up Tuesday. Uh, all right. Well, without further ado, here is my interview with Mark Shanahan and Drew McVetty. I have a, a special guest back on the podcast today, uh, Mark Shanahan, who is the writer and director of A Sherlock Carol. It's uh, back in uh, theaters again this year, uh, live theater. Uh, and it's my dream someday to get out there to see it. But Mark, welcome back to the Cozy Christmas podcast. Thanks, Art. It's good to be with you. And uh, we're also joined with an extra guest today, Drew McVetty. He's an actor and is playing Sh Sherlock this year, correct? That is correct. Yeah. Pleasure to be here. Yes. Well, it's great to meet you and get to know, get to know the man behind the myth, as it were. So, <laughs> <laughs> well, Mark, you had, uh, uh, before we recorded, you had said some wonderful things about Drew. Uh, could you repeat some of that again, just uh, so we can embarrass him on, on the podcast? Yeah, I think that's the way to do it. Let's okay. Um, oh, dear. You know, I, uh, I'm the writer and director of a Sherlock Carol, which is happening off Broadway here in New York City, where we are sitting. Um, but I am happy to have uh, Drew McVitie playing Sherlock uh, here in our production, because Drew, he won't tell you, so I will tell you, is a veteran of um, uh, uh, so many Broadway shows, I can't count them, and is a critic starling here in New York City, and has also played on some of the best regional stages around the country, a career actor of epic proportions and a good friend of mine. And the play was actually written with his voice in mind, so it is a particular thrill that he um, got behind it. And he's also serving, can I tell, tell them everything about you, Drew? He's also Please serving do. Please one do. of the producers on this show. That's how much he, he has loved it and believed in it and championed it. And uh, I am very, very grateful to him for that. Yes. Well, all of these things are true. Um, <laughs> and I'm, I'm happy to say, but also what is also true is what Mark will never tell you about himself, which is that he is a director and writer and actor of epic proportions. And it is true that uh, he, 
created this piece while we were doing a, a show together in Nantucket at the White Heron Theater. We were doing a piece called uh, The Weir. And uh, Mark uh, said, I have this vision for this play. Uh, Sherlock Carroll and I hear your voice doing it. And I said, well, write that play. Yeah. And he did. And uh, it showed up in my inbox in the next uh, couple of months in installments. Uh, and uh, as soon as we did our first reading, I realized that we had a, 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 an instant Christmas classic, which is what we have. And I said, I'm going to produce this. We're going to option it. And we're going to do it exactly where we're doing it right now, off Broadway. And what a pleasure to have one of the finest actor, director, writers in the country, in my opinion. Uh, Mark has worked all over the, the world and uh, the United States as an actor and a director and uh, is a deep, deep uh, aficionado of the Sherlock and Charles Dickens world. Uh, the the uh, Cannon Doyle, the Conan Doyle and uh, Dickens world. And, uh, and you know what? I, I, have to buy him, uh, I have to buy him a bottle of whiskey for saying nice things about me. <laughs> I was going to say. Yeah, yeah, I'll get you one back. <laughs> No problem. Um, there, there's a bribe going on. But this is a long way of saying uh, it's such a pleasure to have a friend who is of such an enormous caliber and, and such a joy to create something like we have together. It really is a highlight of my life, I've got to say. Gotta say. Well, I, yeah, that's it's so great to see, um, you know, that camaraderie when you're trying to create a story together that I, I think it really helps it. Uh, succeed you get you catch that that energy that unity uh, you know and that's just my impressions of looking at some little clips and videos online and pictures and everything it just looks like you all are having a blast doing this this is true uh yeah go ahead mark you want to say well if they say, you know drew and i are joined by so many of the creative team from designers and actors who are also old friends and stage veterans um who just brings such joy to this. You sit in your, you know, I've said it before, but you sit sit in your kitchen in the middle of the night trying to write something, moving salt shakers around on your table, figuring who's off stage, who's on stage, trying to wonder if this thing will work. And then you put it in the hands of actors who can literally, literally in front of your eyes, make your ideas that you were thinking about privately suddenly seem like uh, really good ideas because mm -hmm. they can bring it to life. And we are joined by um, the great Tony nominated uh, actress Isabel Keating, um, the Broadway veteran Mark Price. Uh, we're joined by the great Dan Dominguez uh, as a grown up Tiny Tim, Dr. Cratchit. We're joined this year by two new cast members, Alan Gilmore playing Ebenezer Scrooge, a reformed Scrooge, and the great Joanna Carpenter playing uh, Emma Wiggins and Inspector Lestrade and a whole host of other characters. Uh, together, along with our covers and our incredible design team, it's just a joyous, joyous ensemble. And it's, uh, it's kind of amazing to sit in the theater and watch them do it every night, um, bring it to life. It is really something to see. Yeah. I, I love that uh, you're incorporating characters from both worlds, you know, it, it, the Sherlock and, and Dickens kind of into one story like that. That's neat. Yeah. Drew, would you tell them what the, the play is about, actually? Just <laughs> would you like me to do that? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Well, here's, uh, here's, the, uh, here's, here's what the play is about. Uh, a grown-up Tiny Tim approaches a, uh, a, well, we use the word sometimes, dissolute Sherlock Holmes, who's uh, despondent in any case, and having a very bad Christmas Eve, and asks him to investigate the uh, mysterious death of his benefactor, Ebenezer Scrooge. So it's set 20 years in the future after uh, uh, A Christmas Carol, and Scrooge is now known as the most uh, kind and beneficent man in town because he's done nothing but uh, engage in philanthropy for the last 20 years and become, you know, what Mark always says is to be known as a Scrooge should be known as the nicest man in town, not, not to be a humbug. Mm -hmm. uh, and this is true. And uh, uh, Tiny Tim has grown up to a children's hospital and um, become a very, very good man himself. And Sherlock Holmes, on the other hand, has just come from uh, the scene in Reichenbach where uh, Moriarty plunged to his death and is finding a very difficult time finding any purpose in the world and uh, and is despondent, sad and depressed and, and dare I say going through a midlife crisis if nothing else and trying to find his place. Um, and that's that's what the show is about. <laughs> well, you can take it from there, Mark. What happens next? Well, what's fun is that with six actors playing multiple roles, we visit all the characters from Charles Dickens' um, 
universe as well as Conan Doyle's. And I kind of tried to marry Dick and Doyle's only uh, real Christmas story with Sherlock, uh, which is called The Adventure of the Blue Carbuncle, along with um, the world of Charles Dickens' The Christmas Carol. So we meet various uh, ancestors of some of the characters like the Fezziwigs, but we also meet um, and Tiny Tim but, uh, and his sister Martha Cratchit. But we also meet um, ca characters from uh, the Conan Doyle, everyone from um, uh, the Countess of Morcar to Inspector Lestrade and, of course, Dr. Watson and a whole host of others. And these two stories got to go hand in hand. And there's a missing blue diamond, a missing will, a mysterious death and uh, 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 perhaps even a murderer on the loose out there. But it is a, a joyous and silly romp that actually um, very surprisingly kind of cuts to the core and feels really heartfelt in, in these actors' hands too. Uh, and then there's uh, at least one ghost I've noticed. Uh, <laughs> is Scrooge uh, kind of a, in a, they're in ghost form or? I don't know if I should tell you this. Oh, Art. okay, okay, well, maybe not. Spoilers, yeah. <laughs> you for when you see it someday, but the nice thing about Scrooge is that, yes, as Drew said, he spent um, the rest of his life being a great, great man. We only see that at the end of A Christmas Carol briefly, but he spends, you know, many years making amends for um, not having been his best self and um, being, being a taking care of his fellow man as the ghost said warned him to do i always like to say in a christmas carol you know we always say there are three ghosts but they're actually spirits not ghosts there's only one ghost and that's jacob marley and i like that we point that out in a sherlock carol um scrooge does take on um the idea of the spirit of christmas and in his own way and uh helps sort of guide sherlock uh to learn his own lesson it's a different journey for sherlock and it's for scrooge but who better to teach you the true meaning of christmas than um, perhaps the character who had to learn it the hard way uh, and the best way uh, more than anyone else in the history of literature. Yeah, I have I have a T-shirt that just says Mr. Scrooge on it and, and I'll wear it. Uh, and people will say like, that that's not you at all. Why are you wearing that? <laughs> and I said, well, it's post change here, you know. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. yeah. We should all aspire to be a Scrooge, yeah. Yes. Uh, the good yeah. kind, but so our, you know, the guy who plays uh, this wonderful actor, our friend who Alan Gilmore, who plays Scrooge in this year's iteration of the show, he's played Ebenezer Scrooge in um, uh, on stage in in um, mm. countless productions of A Christmas Carol, and he's having a really interesting and fun time, kind of discovering that this is the character he knows, but it's what happened to him afterwards, and how to revisit that. So the character is deeply in his bones. He loves this yeah. character having played it in front of, you know, thousands and thousands of people for years, um, the brief moments we see the old Scrooge in him, um, he taps into something he knows so well. And then for him, you know, he keeps coming up to us and saying, oh gosh, you know, to think this is what really happened to him. It's wonderful to experience um, the sequel of sorts to A Christmas Carol yeah, yeah, yeah. and find out what, how Scrooge, what he really learned from that night. Um, mm -hmm. He's just terrific. You would love him, Mark. Mm. Yeah, I, uh, I, I saw... You know, again, I was looking at some of the, the photos and stuff online and it just uh, it looks good. Like, like to see him smiling and happy, you know, it, it's it just it's like, yeah, you know, he had such a great life after that, uh, that, you know, he, he realized he could change. He could make a difference. And he just ran with it. <laughs> we like to think so. Yeah. Yeah. Drew, I was going to ask you a bit about uh, what it's like to portray Sherlock Holmes. I mean. Talk about stepping into some big shoes, you know? <laughs> yeah, I guess so. I mean, it's a, an iconic role that's been played by the great actors of generation after generation of generation, all the way back to Robert Gillette. And, um, William, the, William. Richard, William Gillette, excuse me. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, and uh, I, 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 when we were putting it together last year and putting out the first time, these I had concerns about that, and I watched every portrayal I could find and read every bit I could find. Um, and it wasn't until we were well into previews last year that I started to think, "Oh, I can, I can beat this fellow. <laughs> it's okay." I forgave myself for for attempting these these big shoes uh, because people were saying things to me like, "You were made for this role," and it, indeed, it was made for me. Uh, so it is tailored around me. But I was a little intimidated by the role itself because I, if I look in the mirror, I don't see Sherlock Holmes. I, I want to look more like Basil Rathbone or more like uh, 
Jeremy Brett or more like uh, Benedict Cumberbatch. Those guys look like Sherlock Holmes. Uh, but it got deeper and deeper into me. And I learned that uh, people will project uh, their image of Sherlock Holmes onto you when you play it. So, uh, so there's that aspect of it. But this year, this year, I'm not concerned about it at all. <laughs> this year, uh, I, because the text, it's, it's a mountain of text. Um, there's, there's a lot of words in this play for Sherlock Holmes. And part of my concern doing it last year was, do I know all those words? This year, they're, they're so deeply in me that uh, there's a lot more being and a lot less showing and a lot less worrying about whether I look like or sound like or am Sherlock Holmes. I just am him this year. And it's, it seems to be working very well. This is going to be an unfair question, but do you have, mm. do you have a favorite uh, actor who portrayed Sherlock? Uh, it, it morphs over time. Uh, there are different portrayals that I absolutely love. Uh, uh, I grew up, I was very fond of Jeremy Brett's uh, portrayal uh, mm -hmm. in the 80s on PBS when we watched them uh, from the PBS. And, uh, and uh, I guess I used that as the starting point, but then I started to see other ones. Christopher Plummer has a great, uh, uh, very, very warm uh, Sherlock that I love. Um, who else? Well, it, it, Robert Downey Jr. is the one who really surprised me because he brought so much level of humor to it uh, that I thought, oh, there's room for him that way, too. He, there are so many aspects to the character. And the audience is, always wants to see more aspects of Sherlock Holmes. They always want to see something they didn't know about him. They want to see him cry. They want to see him laugh. They want to see him have actual feelings, you know. He's not unlike uh, Mr. Spock in Star Trek sometimes. He's, you know, we assume that he's only logical and that he's never going to have any feelings. So anytime that kind of stuff cracks, it's, it's a wonderful portal into, and seems to excite audiences very much. Um, who else? Um, Benedict Cumberbatch just is brilliant in the role. There's no question. Yeah. Um, but so, I don't know, in, in a lot of ways, <laughs> but so is Michael Caine. And what is that one? Uh, without a clue? Is that oh, get a clue? Yeah. Get a clue, yeah. yeah. Without who plays, you know, without a clue, yeah, who plays, a, you know, a bumbling uh, kind of uh, uh, idiot, Sherlock Holmes. Right. And, uh, and that works very well, too. Um, so uh, I love them all. I, I, I'm not going to pick a favorite uh, because it's all kind of melded together in my mind now anyway. <laughs> yeah, that, that's like when somebody asks me if I have a favorite Dickens novel or a or a favorite yeah. Christmas Carol version. It's, you know, it depends on the day. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Awesome. Uh, so with you, uh, so you guys, uh, this play is in uh, happening in, in New York city. You guys are in New York city. Is that right? That's right. Uh, and then it's running through till uh, January 1st, I believe I saw. So what's uh, what's Christmas going to look like for you for your, you and your families? It's got to be pretty hectic. Uh, well, mercifully, for the company, we have um, Christmas Eve off, and then we don't have a performance until Christmas evening on the day of uh, Christmas. So we'll get Christmas Eve, and we get Christmas morning, and then you know just about the time you're starting to get a little itchy and ready to go out, we can go to a show. So we'll be okay. Um, it is a uh, it is a, a, a heightened schedule for us because we want to get all the people in we can see through the Christmas season. So we're going to be good and exhausted by the time we get to January 1st. Hmm. Um, in New York right now, it looks like Christmas has already exploded. We have the tree up at Rockefeller Center. Um, Radio yeah. City is, is decked out for the Christmas Spectacular. And our theater is only a couple of blocks away. And uh, it's really something to walk through Midtown right now and get that. There's really like it new york at christmas is really something um i just came back from uh london where i was directing the the london production of a sherlock carol which is now playing and will play through january 8th and it was really something too while i was there to see them starting to deck the halls and get the uh lights up on oxford street and uh and piccadilly circus and everywhere else and um london does it pretty well too i have to say uh it was really i, I went over to visit charles dickens house the dickens museum and they were already decking the halls and putting out copies of Christmas Carol everywhere. So I've had the Christmas um, spirit. We started rehearsals in, in October for this. And so I feel like I've been living with Christmas since October in a good way every day. And um, 
now that the play is up, I'm looking forward also to sitting in the audience and watching my uh, friends put the show on and give me a little bit of Christmas spirit and also um, spend the time with my family here here in New York where I live, um, uh, trying to just uh, uh, drink it all in because it is actually a very celebratory and uh, happy time, particularly after the difficult years we've all gone through to sort of have it yeah. to, to sit still and, and um, be really appreciative and grateful for the many good things yeah. that we have. Yeah. Well, and one of the benefits I have as a producer of this piece is I can have my I kids know. come and see. Oh, excuse me. I can uh, oh, there, I have my my kids uh, can come see the show anytime they want and bring their friends. So we we I'm doing my best to center all of our Christmas right around this play because um, and it works very well. We have friends come and see it, and then we'll go out for drinks afterwards or whatever. Um, yeah. Art, for those of us who work in the theater, too, the last couple of years are so hard because we, you know, there was so long where theaters were shut down. And then coming back, it was uh, tenuous and figuring out how to do it. Last year, we did it and we were really proud of it. But, you know, kids weren't vaccinated yet um, by December. Right. And um, so this year, we're actually able to have families come to the show to bring their kids right. and to hear giggles and laughter in the audience and it's a really different feeling and really special it's a really fun show for kids to see because it's really a celebration of, of actors and theater making and like that backyard acting that you did as a kid where you just say you're on a pirate ship and you are um our actors walk out in a different costume every once every few minutes and say they're a different character and the kids giggle i love to hear it when parents bring you know uh, kids to, to see a show and sort of revel in how great actors are and how much fun it is to see them play these many characters mm -hmm. you get, and you got to think that you know out there in the audience with those kids they're catching the theater bug now and might inspire them to hey i want to i want to do that you know i hope so yeah yeah for so many kids, um, the Christ a Christmas Carol production in their hometown is the first and sometimes only time that they get to see live performance. Yeah. Christmas Carol is a gateway to theater going, but also for a lot of actors for uh, how they were introduced to something that became their profession. So um, there's nothing better, frankly, than um, inviting people to a Christmas show to sort of celebrate the season, but also to be storytellers, because that's what a large part of Christmas is about. I'm remembering now that I played Scrooge once. I've only played Scrooge once, and I did in the fourth grade at uh, Roosevelt Elementary School. And How'd you do, Drew? Scandal. What were your reviews like? Were... Oh, I was fantastic. They gave me some sort of bald cap, I remember. Like, uh, <laughs> yeah. but, and I had to have my, my nightgown on, of course, and there was a huge scandal because my underpants were, were in full view at some point. <laughs> <laughs> but, but as I recall, I got, I got some good respect from the other kids uh, for playing Scrooge in, in the fourth grade. I'd pay good money to see it. I really would. Oh, yeah. yeah. Two yeah. parents have it on videotape because I'm ready to well, see I gotta, it. Yeah, I got to find a spirit to take me back to my past. You know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, Drew, what what uh, led you to become an actor? Is it maybe acting like that in, in, as a child? or? Yeah, I, I was bit by the bug early. Uh, my family, uh, in, I grew up in Michigan, and my family... Uh, were members of the community theater, the Port Huron Little Theater, Port Huron, Michigan. And I was in my first play when I was five. I was a young boy in chorus in Music Man who steals show uh, and gets a big laugh. And as soon as I heard that first laugh, I was bit forever. Um, and uh, I was a theater rat the entire time I was growing up. wound up uh, going to uh, NYU at 18. And in my first Broadway show by the time I was 22, 21, right after graduating from NYU. What was that show, dude? That was the Heidi Chronicles, which went on to win the best Tony, uh, or, no, a good Tony for the best play, mm -hmm. um, and the Pulitzer and the everything. It won everything. I mean, I was the luckiest actor in New York to be in that show and have wow. that be my Broadway debut. Mm -hmm. And then the second, here just to talk about me, the second Broadway show I did uh, was Titanic, the musical, which also won best musical. Uh, and that was in 96. So off the bat, uh, I got to be in two Broadway shows that went on to be Tony winners, both of them, and in both categories of Broadway, a, a legitimate play and a musical theater play. And because of that, I was then allowed as uh, in the casting director's eyes to audition for both and be in legitimate plays as well as music, musical theater plays. And uh, it's a very, very fortunate, very fortunate career. 
my folks from Port Huron are actually in New York this week. They're going to see the show tonight. I've got my mom, dad, and oh, uh, four cousins tonight, and then two two nephews tomorrow. It's it's family week. It's fantastic. So that's great. Yeah, yeah. They've got to be proud of you. So uh, that's neat. I think they are. I think. So. I hope so. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I hope so. By this point, I'm a bit better. Yeah. <laughs> if. Uh, folks want to uh, get tickets, and I know some of you live in New York City. Uh, I, I, I have, I'll, I'll name names if I have to. So go and uh, see this show. Uh, but where can they get tickets at? Oh, well, it's as easy as uh, firing up your Google machine and uh, uh, putting a Sherlock Carol in the, in the Google uh, box. And uh, you'll be taken to our website. You can get the tickets right there. Um, if anyone's listening in London, um, Sherlock Carroll is playing at the Marylebone Theater, and uh, uh, you can find tickets online for that, for our sister production over there as well. And, you know, Art, we hope that um, uh, next year that it will actually be coming to a town near you. We've licensed the play through Broadway licensing, and um, we're very happy that a number of theaters around the country are expressing interest in trying to um, license it for their Christmas offering next year. So I'm mm -hmm. looking forward. I think Drew probably is too, to uh, sitting in an audience too and seeing how other people interpret it and do it one day. And, and, Absolutely. Uh, next year, uh, it might be fun for, uh, I hope Drew's playing the role again, of course, but it, uh, I also wish that I could grab him and do a road trip and visit all the theaters around the country who uh, might do it and uh, sit there and enjoy all the different takes on it. So um, <laughs> that is a date hope for sure. We're going to do that. Yeah. Any other theaters will contact Broadway Licensing and want to do it. Yeah, great. Uh, so let's see, Omaha Playhouse, if you're listening, uh, <laughs> that's that's the theater closest to me. It's about 40 miles or, or well, 40 oh, minute man. drive. So yeah, they, they do a great uh, Christmas Carol production every year. It's it's kind of become an Omaha tradition. Uh, nice. I, I want to say the guy who plays Scrooge has done it for about 20, 25 years in a row. Uh, that's and wonderful. He's so good at it. It, it I, I've gotten to see it a couple times. It's just really well done. Yeah, it's great. So yeah. Well, um, I've got some Christmas questions here for you. Uh, see, we'll see, uh, test. I don't know if we're going to test your Christmas spirit or what, but uh, and and these are our most of these are are silly and fun. So have have fun with it. But uh, my first question uh, for you. Uh, I guess for, for you both, uh, have you ever re-gifted a present? Oh, yeah. Mm. Yeah. Or maybe I should have asked, uh, have you ever been caught re-gifting a present? <laughs> but usually it's you're either getting pajamas or a candle or something that you can't. And you realize that you are not doing any, uh, you're not offending anyone because it's been re-gifted to you. <laughs> so, <laughs> somebody else. And there's an unspoken rule. Let's just keep passing this one around. So. Well, yeah, yeah, yeah. Many times. Yeah. Yeah. And so my, in fact, in my family, there's a tradition. We have a grab bag of uh, re-gifts that just keep happening over and over again in, in exactly the way that Mark is describing, where you just get sometimes terrible things, a ballpoint pen or, you know, uh, uh, an egg beater or something, you know, uh, that somebody gifted. You do put lumps of coal in there, so it's possible you could get one. Oh, no. <laughs> Nice. I do know, uh, I can't remember who told me this now, but they, their family had kind of a cabinet where they would store gifts they need to re, they want to re-gift. So if they ever had to go to a party at the last minute, they could just grab something. And then they ended up giving the gift back to the person that they had gotten it from. And that was really awkward. So <laughs> I've received a wrap book with a card that was inside it for someone else, you know, oh. George, I know I thought of you immediately with this one. So you just kind of look the other way. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> this might be kind of a how well do you know each other kind of question. Uh, right. So so which of you uh, is more likely to wait until the last minute to do Christmas shopping? Oh, I'm going to say me. I'm going to say him too. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, Mark. You look a little guilty there. <laughs> I am guilty, but I'm getting away with it because before we got on with you, um, I, my browser is still open to Amazon. I'm trying to do it now. And I know for a fact that Drew hasn't done any of his Christmas show. I just, I can look at his face and tell you on Zoom. But it's also, true. I just have time. He's doing eight shows a week right now. 
Uh, and I feel like this guy is lucky if he actually gets out there and, and you know, buys a pair of socks to give someone. So. <laughs> That's true. Well, I do have lists and I do have plans and, uh, and thank God for the internet, I'll be able to pull it off. But, um, but Mark is an extraordinarily good gift giver too. He just is. He, uh, I have presents from opening night last year and this year that I cherish from Mark. And, uh, I will keep forever. I like to put a little, little muscle into yeah. thing. Yeah. You're good at it. <laughs> Yeah, I I've gotten better at it over the years myself. Uh, there there's been a couple years where I've been kind of scrambling at the last minute, and uh, you know, especially for gifts for my wife, and and that's a good way to get yourself in trouble, you know. <laughs> well, you know what the real secret is, Art. You it, it, this is the only way to do it. When you see that thing in July, and instead of saying, "Oh, keep that in mind," get it right then because you're going to regret it later. Uh, just get it, put it, shove it under the bed or something, and don't don't and forget about it until suddenly you realize, wait a minute, didn't I buy something already? But <laughs> yeah, just get it out of the way. Well, uh, last it was maybe last year or two years ago, uh, I got her shopping done uh, really early, you know, and it was all on online. I did it all on Amazon, uh, yeah. well, I, well, mostly on Amazon, and and then suddenly, you know, it's halfway through the Christmas season, and I realized she's scrambling around trying to find time to shop for the kids and stuff. And I'm like, Oh, I'm a jerk. I, I need to help you out here. <laughs> I, Cause I'm done. <laughs> great. It's great. When Christmas teaches you lessons, like I'm a jerk. Right. It? <laughs> exactly. Yeah. That's my Scrooge moment. I think. Yeah. <laughs> I'm too good at Christmas guilt. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> now bet between you two, uh, who do you think would, would be better at playing a, a department store Santa. That's a good one. Um, I think it could be it could be Drew again. I have to say. I don't know, man. I can I can see you pulling off Santa like. Nobody. I think I'd like to, but then I, I in a competitive way, I think I have a feeling that you'd have a whole script written and you'd be good at it. You know. <laughs> I, I I know I can manage twinkle in the eye. I can twinkle pretty well. So. <laughs> I don't know. I'm looking forward to it, though. I, I, I'm, that's another role I'm looking forward to at some point. I do want to find a way to play Santa at some point. Now I got to write a play for you to play Santa? Okay. I think that's a great idea, actually. I really do. <laughs> some kind of uh, Santa crisis. I, I think yeah. uh, Santa Santaism is is just about the best uh, best of all theologies, if you ask me. It's very simple, naughty, mm -hmm. nice, reward. <laughs> <laughs> or not. <laughs> yeah. It's a very good moral code, and and I'm all for it. Yeah, <laughs> right, I'm going to nominate you. You've got a beard. You already, you're already halfway there. there you go. Yeah, it's starting to turn white too. Go. Yeah. Um, well, that's. I mean, I would love to myself one day. I, it's kind of in my my family. In fact, my my grandfather played uh, would dress up as Santa. He'd go to his friends owned a bookstore, so he would go and be Santa there, and would sometimes go to schools. And then uh, my dad be, was doing it for a while when he worked at a hardware store. He uh, uh he would play Santa. And uh, so now it's, they're like, okay, it's your turn, Art. You know, <laughs> well, got to gotta get there. So <laughs> you're next. I'm next. Yeah. I feel like uh, we're passing on a sacred tradition or something. <laughs> there you go. Talking about bucket lists. That's on my bucket list for sure. <laughs> All right. Uh, talking about some Christmas foods. I love food. And I'll, I'll ask these. I usually ask, you know, what are your favorites? I'll ask that in a moment, but I, I did find one I thought was an interesting question. What about the grossest Christmas food that you've ever had? Mm. Or has it been a hundred percent good? No. Is it totally sacrilegious to say that I just can't get through eggnog though? Is that right? Oh, it might. I'm going to have to kick you out of this conversation. I know. <laughs> yeah, I enjoy a good nog. What I, 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 in, I was in Vienna for Christmas one year and they, they would serve something called, well, there was a lot of schmaltz happening, you know, the, the fat that you would spread on everything, literally, uh, you know, chicken fat. And that grossed me out a little bit. And Glühwein, which is their, their sugared malted wine, which is okay, but, uh, but wasn't to my liking. No. So I, mm. I, but I wouldn't call it gross. Sure. I, and I could, you know, I could, it was spiced wine. I could still taste the Christmas in it, but I wasn't guzzling it like everyone else was. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, I, I gotta say it was probably, uh, for me, it was, uh, mince meat pie when I first tried oh, it. Yeah. I, I was just a kid and it smelled really good. So then I took a bite and I'm like, 
grandma, what is this terrible thing? <laughs> I mouth? know what it was. It was those uh, fruit cakes that my grandmother always had, which were like way and uh, were horrible, just horrible. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, my my uh, in our house we're also an interfaith family. My wife is Jewish, and so December is filled with like we get to have latkes as well as uh, uh, yeah. mm -hmm. uh, you know a full on Christmas spread uh, at Christmas. So it is uh, it is that kind of thing where you get out of December and then have to starve yourself through January for us because it's yeah. just it's just a constant uh, December. And and then you also let yourself eat every dessert under the sun, which is also dangerous, but makes me so happy. <laughs> yeah, it does. Required. Yeah, it, it's okay. Those cal those calories don't count, you know. Yeah, right. The holiday <laughs> calories. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Uh, now, uh, how about how about some of your favorite Christmas foods? The I, I do. Can I say this? I do miss my grandmother used to make just some of the best, you know, even the stuffing for at Thanksgiving, but also during Christmas. And, and try as you might, sometimes you can't replicate or at least what you think some of those things were in your childhood. My grandfather made the best apple pie also. And as soon as you walk into or walk past bakeries, and especially at this time of year and you smell those things, I, I start remembering all those meals from when I was a kid. But now as I've grown up, sometimes on Christmas, believe it or not, on my mother's side, we're Italian, I have lasagna on Christmas day, uh, on Christmas nice. Eve, great beef tenderloin that my, my sister would make this year. My wife's going to attempt it. Um, but we always now we're thinking about should we mix up the the traditions too and and mix up the menus um, and try some new things also. You should really you know Drew is a actually an excellent chef. I mean you should well, he's cooked for my whole family before and it is something. So I I can't imagine Drew. There's one thing that you make at Christmas, but no, I'm I'm definitely like picking uh, and choosing as we're talking here because generally for myself I like to do like a duck on Christmas Eve and maybe. A, a Christmas risotto with that'll you use some goose stock for and uh, yeah. do some pistachios and cranberries in so it's green and red. But we did this wonderful thing after Sherlock uh, uh, closed last year where we put together a menu of a Sherlock Carol and did, uh, uh, which was a kind of, a, when I think about it, the ultimate Christmas feast the, uh, and the Dickens and, and Doyle feast. Uh, gruel was the first course and it was a barley risotto that was pretty darn good, made with goose stock. Then we had a big roast goose and uh, uh, potatoes and green peas and just as British traditionally as we could. And then we had a figgy bread pudding for dinner, dessert. And you uh, had your friend who's a mixologist create Victorian cocktails for everyone. That was something. Yes, I did. Yeah, for every course. <laughs> Boy, that was fun. I never had goose. That was so, I've never had it in my life until that in my life. It was great. It was really delicious. It's a delicious bird. No question sure. about it. Yeah. 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 Um... I was going to say, how does it compare with turkey? But it's kind of hard to describe a taste, I guess. Well, yeah, it's it's somewhere between turkey and duck and 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 kind of closer to a good steak. It, it doesn't have the gaminess of duck and. Uh, and it, it, but at the same time, it's super rich, so it, it is almost like beef in a way, but but has the consistency of a turkey, say, uh, yeah. Hmm. Well, I'm hungry now, so thanks. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> drooling over here, yeah. Uh, and then uh, th this one's this one could be fun. Uh, what song would you absolutely kill during k Christmas karaoke? Oh. And I'm, not, I'm not sure if killing a song is is that good or bad. I I, I thought it oh, was yeah. good. You mean what but, would you be great at? What would yeah, you be great yeah. At? I'm trying to think of it. <laughs> <laughs> It's different than what's your favorite because true. Right. right. What we're, what he's at, what we're really asking is what would you be good at? What would you be good at? And right. since you know, I only sing in the shower and Drew sings on Broadway, it does <laughs> not a fair comparison. Not a, not a fair comparison. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, you know, there's this part of me that just says rocking around the Christmas tree. Are we Jingle or rock? That's a good one. Um, what is it? Uh, Jack Frost living at your nose. What's that the one called? Christmas song. Yeah, not, yeah, yeah, the Christmas, yeah, the Christmas song. song. That would be mine. I we call it just not a title, title, but, but it's not. It's called it Christmas. <laughs> yeah. That one I could crush. White Christmas I'd have a lot of fun with. Sure. Uh, you know what? Though? I always think my mom's favorite, and I always it kills me every time I hear it, though, is I'll Be Home for Christmas. That's oh, that is a good one. Every time. Yeah. 
First three notes yeah. and, I'm, and I'm gone. Yeah. 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 Oh man. Yeah. Now, now I, now I want to know what's your, do you have a favorite Christmas song? Um, just to kind of jump off that. Again, favorite is, is hard for me. Yeah. Um, and, you know, you can't go wrong with a good deck to halls. I'm just saying, just saying you can't go wrong. really. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And you know, I, it, it, the, anything where from your childhood, but you know, all the, uh, from Charlie Brown, Christmas, Christmas time is here, or, you know, oh, yeah, yeah. Oh, the yeah. Island and put one foot in front of the other and all those things from those. So those are always good. I like them. They're not, they don't count as like Hark the Herald. This is a harder question than art. You didn't, I was told there would be no map. <laughs> <laughs> Oh. Yeah. All, uh, right, I, all right, all right. <laughs> Christmas music is is really I know this sounds dorky, but I think it's magic. I really do. I mean, mm-hmm. they're just melodies, but they they have so much meaning that that you can't get away from them, and they and yeah. and they excite a, a different kind of feeling in you than any other song does. I do uh, love the Vince Guaraldi stuff from Charlie Brown. That's oh great. yeah, yeah you the Frank Sinatra that. albums are all good. I can't, you can't oh. go wrong. Yeah. 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 And my daughter is listening to a lot of Taylor Swift Christmas, and it's growing on me. I got to be honest. With you. Well, um, man, and th- so is is the Hallelujah chorus. I mean, it, uh, it goes uh, or or Green Sleeves. It goes. Those are some of the oldest songs in, in the Western music canon, and yeah. they still have that that magical cheese. I, I only want to listen to this at this time of year, and it only I, works then. I, I wrote a um a, a adaptation of a Christmas Carol that's also being done right now at Virginia Stage down in Norfolk, and uh, I was up in Nantucket at the White Heron Theater, and all, and it's been done around. Um, it's also available on uh, the Westport Country Playhouse's website this month uh, in our radio version, which um which is really wonderful, and I was very proud of that we did during the pandemic. But um I will and also and through WSHU in Connecticut, but. In that piece, um, we included the Wexford Carol, which not too many people know about. But if you listen, if you're listening to this and you want to Google, um, Yo-Yo Ma does a beautiful rendition of it that's on um, on YouTube, which it's just a beautiful and sort of now ancient Christmas song. And it's really something. And I had not heard it until I was an adult, but I really love it. I think it's fantastic. I'm getting a cozy Christmas feeling um, as we talk about this. I, I want to say, yeah, it's good. That's the that's the goal. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, all right. Uh, and then, speaking of cozy Christmas, how, what? How would you make Christmas cozy? What What makes Christmas cozy to you? For me, it's a, it's a, a burning wood a fireplace, an actual fireplace is, and the crackle and the smell and the the warmth from a fire. That gets me. Mm. I like to stay up after everyone else has gone to sleep and yeah. spend a little time with the tree myself. And yeah. or when all the lights in the house are off except for the tree lights. Yeah. Oh, that's good. That's, that's yeah. sort of a good way to get through life. Counting, you know, it's the end of the year and you do take stock. And you mm-hmm. go, one down. What's coming up? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh just taking those moments to just to to think to sit to rest whatever sometimes we forget to do that and can really yeah. go crazy and burn ourselves out but yeah definitely uh yeah i like i like to do that i like to just go outside even at, when it's christmas eve when it's night and the whole neighborhood is just quiet it, it's just there's just that sense of anticipation uh it, it's it's wonderful i love it yeah I, i'm a big fan of that particular time too i think christmas eve is is slightly more magic than christmas day because yeah. of anticipation honestly yeah it's the oh, we're almost there uh yeah that's why our play takes place on christmas eve it certainly it's does there, isn't it? it's a day of magic and I, yeah and i loved this last year as it gets closer and closer to christmas eve the the audience gets more and more charged as we get closer to it it's, it's yeah. kind of interesting and so the actors no doubt yeah, I, I always say my, my favorite day is Christmas Eve. I mean, I, I love Christmas and I and I hate it that so, so many things like as soon as the day is over, you know, the radio goes back to normal music, everything gets shut down. It's like, okay, it's done. Let's move on. And it's like, no, wait, let's let it linger, you know, but <laughs> right, yeah. I, I love Christmas Eve. Uh, just that anticipation, the excitement. I don't know. Yeah. And then for uh, just for the uh, our final question. Um, I think it's so important to show kindness to people, uh, especially this time of year. Everyone's running, stressed, tired, aggravated, angry—all the, all the adjectives. Um, what can we do to 
show kindness towards others or maybe there's something some kind thing that somebody has done for you that you think would be worth sharing hmm. well i can tell you a kind thing mark shanahan has done for me which is create this play um, but and the, i think about this a lot because it is very much what sherlock holmes learns in a sherlock carol is uh, the lesson of of uh, taking care of your fellow man as being the focus and it occurs to me that there are endless, endless possibilities of, of kindness every day <laughs> with just the way you treat your cashier at the, at the grocery store to actual people in your neighborhood who need help and you can help them. You know, uh, the woman who you walk by and see that she's having uh, trouble getting her walker in the trunk and you say, can I help? She will say yes. And then you will have helped your fellow man. Those kind of things can happen every moment of every day. Um, and then there's larger things that, you know, we're, we're, uh, Mark has been associated. We, actually, Mark, you should talk about it, the hole in the wall camp. Um, yeah, you can tell them what we're going to do with it. Well, we're, we're, uh, Mark has been associated with the hole in the wall camp, which is, uh, the, uh, uh, camp that was set up by Paul Newman uh, to uh, give seriously ill children uh, the ability to go to summer camp, and um, it's and Mark has directed their benefit production every year, and uh, we are going to be doing curtain speeches at a Sherlock Carol every night and asking for donations to this camp as as people leave. You know, there's the I want Mark to say this too because he'll say it really well. The uh, the uh, Dickens quote about uh, generosity and what what uh, Fred says to uh, Scrooge and do do that thing, Mark. Do that. Well, well yeah. When <laughs> Fred says it is a kind and forgiving time, and we are all fellow passengers to the grave, mm, and yes. um, he tells his uncle basically he will come around every year, you know, even if his uncle says bah humbug. There is something about keeping um, a smile on the face of some adversity, and Lord knows we all face some adversity. When I work with um, camp, um, I am actually inspired and um, and sort of blown away by the incredible spirit from the campers and the families at Hole in the Wall Gang Camp, um, which Mr. Newman founded, Paul Newman, the actor, founded uh, to provide what he called a different kind of healing. And I'm very proud. It actually in informed our, um, uh, a little bit of my writing of a Sherlock Carol, our grown up Tiny Tim, who himself was an ill child, uh, in our story, becomes a doctor and opens a hospital to help um, uh, children who suffered as he did when he was a boy. And some of that idea definitely came from my experiences working with Holden Wall Gang Camp and the families and the kids that I get to meet. Um, every year we get to have incredible Broadway and Hollywood performers come, but really we highlight them working alongside the kids because the kids are the ones who are were there to celebrate. Um, and, and I will say that uh, I'm proud that our show is, is partnering to try and raise some money for uh, these kids. And if you are listening to this and you have the opportunity to donate some money, that if you could go to the website for the Hole in the Wall Gang Camp, there is a toggle right there that will say, please donate. Uh, all that money goes directly. No child or family pays uh, anything to send their kid to camp. Um, and it is certainly a remarkable institution run by remarkable people. Um, that said, if you don't have money to do it, there it's not the only way to help people, right? There are all sorts of ways um, to lend your talent and your time. Uh, even uh, writing to some uh, some some of the people there uh, will give you ideas of how you can help. But um, that's true about everything, you know. Mm -hmm. You don't have to have money to be helping people, or if you don't, if you if you're not in that position, you can um, extend yourself. I've been thinking about it lately. Art, uh, and answer your question. Right now, I'm trying to use this time of year to write to and reach out to people I haven't spoken to in a long time and just say, I'm thinking of you. Not to ask anything of them, not to do anything, because sometimes just hearing from people is more important than we think. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I I can remember my uh, when my grandparents passed away, uh, You know, we went to help clean out their house and they had kept every single letter uh, uh, their grandkids had ever sent them. Like, so we had handwritten letters of from us when we were kids from real little to teenagers and you know I, I kind of realized then that well just even handwriting a letter meant something to them that they wanted to hold on to it and it was carefully filed away in their desk you know and and it was yeah. really a precious thing to find yeah yeah um well I will uh have 
a link in our show notes for that organization if, if folks want to help Thanks, donate. Sir. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. It's a remarkable place uh, with the best the best people you can possibly imagine, and and it really does give kids who are fighting uh, something to look forward to and mm -hmm. and uh, their spirits, and it's an important thing. I mm -hmm. promise you, it's a great place. Wonderful, wonderful. Well, uh, Drew and Mark both, thank you so much for coming on today. I don't know if, do you, if you have a show tonight at, at all, or is this a day I off? I do. I do. And as soon as we're done here, I'll get in the subway and head over to Manhattan. All right. I'm in my apartment now. I might jump on the subway and go down and watch you do it tonight, Drew. <laughs> <laughs> you're, you're more than welcome, of course. Well, and if uh, any of my audience listening gets a chance to uh, to see you guys, uh, I, let, let them know. Let them know that Art sent you, and uh, they'll give you a free high five or something. I don't know. <laughs> so, yeah. Well, uh, good good luck. Break a leg and all that uh, tonight. And uh, thank you again for coming on and for creating such a a, a wonderful idea for a play. I uh, I think folks will enjoy it. Thanks, sir. We appreciate your spreading the word, and also for having us on to talk about um, all these great things. We wish you a very happy holiday and a lot of joy in the new year. All right, you too. Happy holiday, Hart. Yeah, thank you so much. All right, thank you for listening. I will be back again in just a couple of days. Uh, the episodes are coming out fast and furious now uh, as we get closer to Christmas. Uh, if you'd like to help support the show... There will be some links in the show notes. I've got an Etsy store. I've got some a merchandise stores. And also, if you make any kind of financial donation on Kofi.com, I will send you a Christmas card and sticker. Also, please check out the show notes because in, uh, uh, I'll also have a link there for the Hole in the Wall Gang camp that Mark was talking about. Uh, if you feel like you'd love to donate to that. All right. With that, until next time, remember to be kind to each other and do good. And as always, let us honor Christmas in our heart and try to keep it all the year. Have a very Merry Christmas.